Father, we love you. Our hearts tremble and shudder to consider what it is that you did for us. Father, we do not understand such love, but you did it anyway. You did it to make a way for us to come home. Please be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What an absolute beautiful lead into our study tonight as we start in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. We have a, a very short for us study tonight, only eight chapters if my count is right. We're at this weird kind of spot at the end of Isaiah where we have uh, too many chapters to fit into one study, but too few to really fill up two. So the plan is that we will get to chapter 60 tonight. Then the, the next time we meet, we will go chapter 61 through 66, finish up the book of Isaiah and start to dip our toe into the book of Jeremiah. Uh, you would think as you leave the 66 chapters of Isaiah, this tremendous uh, book that we have, that it would all be downhill from here. There's only 50 some odd chapters in Jeremiah, and that's totally true. But here's the fun part. There's more verses in it, each chapter in Jeremiah. It's actually longer, even though there's less chapters. So there's still quite a bit of reading to, to stay uh, up with the study as we go through it. But we are uh, cresting this hump as it were, this mountain right here in the middle of the Bible as to go through Isaiah and Jeremiah and really start to understand what the books of the prophets and prophecy itself is like. Here we start with 53. Now, when we left off in chapter 52 last time, I, I mentioned those last few verses. What we're looking at is a picture of the Messiah glorified. Yes, his body beaten and bruised for us the marks of what it took for us to have a way to go home visible on his body, that he was, his body was more broken than any man. It, it took more abuse than any man who ever lived. But it, in that moment, we see him glorified. And the reason that we need to see him glorified, even though his body will deal with what it will deal with as it is tortured and as it is crucified, is because we need to know as we go into chapter 53, the end of the story in advance. Because it's just too much. Chapter 53 begins with this question. Who has believed our message? Who has believed our report? The idea is, uh, the, at the beginning of the chapter, is that no one is going to believe what we are going to tell them. No one will believe that the Messiah will undergo what he is going to go through. This is one of the great proofs to show that the Christianity we believe, the, uh, the religion, if you will, that, that we follow, the, uh, the mindset that we have is not something made up by men because men would not have made up a story like this. We wouldn't have taken the, the, the head figure, the one who's going to save us, and allowed him to go through such torture and, and beating and despair, to be despised and spit upon and looked down on by anybody. We wouldn't have come up with a story where the hero did that. Even the Jews themselves will struggle with this exact thing. Peter in Matthew 16, after he has that wonderful moment where he confesses who the Christ is, when Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. And after Jesus congratulates him on this, but not because there was anything good in Peter, but because my Father in heaven told you about this, he proceeds to tell them that the Messiah is going to suffer and crucified and die and be raised up again. But Peter struggles with this. And he tells the Lord, God forbid that this should happen to you. That's how this chapter starts. You won't believe what I'm about to tell you. In verse 2, we have the only physical description of the Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry. And here's the description. He was totally ordinary. Now, I say that, and a part of you kicks back just a little bit. He goes, what do you mean this is the only physical description we have of Jesus? I have a picture of him on my wall, and he's the best-looking Irishman you've ever seen. But this is what we're told. He was totally ordinary. There was nothing to write home about. That's the description we're told. Now, in the beginning of Revelation, we will see a picture of the resurrected Christ, and that is totally different. But when he comes in his first coming, in his earthly ministry to save us all, we are told that he appears just like anybody else. And that's so important because it points to his mission. Jesus came to take all of our places, not just the fancy people, not just the beautiful people, not just the erudite, not just the upper class. 
He came to take everyone's place. So on the outside, he looked like anybody else. But while he came as the everyman, he endured what no one else could possibly have endured. Because what he endured, not just the physical pain, but the payment of sin, he paid for everyone. The billions of people who have ever lived or will ever live. Verse 3, we're told that he was despised and forsaken. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We can never, ever cry out to God and go, what do you know about my pains? Jesus goes, I know. I know about it more than you. For he bore our griefs and our sorrows, verse 4. He was afflicted and smitten by God. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Our judgment fell upon him, and by his stripes, by the physical scourging of his body, we are healed. Let that sink in. Does does any of that make sense? Verse 6 tells us we're the ones who deserve punishment because we're all like sheep. We have all gone astray. At the absolute best, all we will ever be is dumb sheep. Dumb sheep who can't survive on themselves. Don't believe what the TV tells you. Sheep are not cute. They're ugly, they're dirty, and they smell. And to boot, they can't survive on their own. But the Lord caused our inequity, the inequity of all these sheep, to fall upon the shepherd who swore to take care of us. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not protest. Like a lamb led to a slaughter, he did not open his mouth. Now, this appears to be a contradiction, because in the Gospels, we know that he does speak up. He speaks to Pilate. At one point, he speaks to Caiaphas. So what's going on? The idea of he didn't protest, that he didn't open up his mouth, is that he didn't assert his rights. He didn't go, I'm innocent. What are you guys doing? In fact, the the questions that he answers are the ones that he has to answer. Tell us the truth before God. Are you the son of God? He has to say yes. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. Pilate asked him, are you a king? What you say is correct. He has to say it. Why? Because it's the truth. He cannot deny who he is. But he doesn't protest against his persecutors. He doesn't appeal his rights. Instead, like a lamb to a slaughter, he lets them lead him to his death. He was killed by those he was sent to save. And while he would die among criminals, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Verse 10 has a stunning statement in it. In my Bible, I have this word circled. It pleased, that's the word. It pleased the Lord to crush him. We look at that and we don't understand. How could it please the father to see this happen to his son? This idea of please doesn't mean that he took delight in the Messiah's plan, even though the word can mean that. Rather, the idea is that the father understood and was satisfied with what happened. Because what the father understood was this. This was the only way. It was the only way for a holy God to remain holy. And for a sinful people who had received the free will choice to be redeemed and to be saved. It was the only way for us to be saved. The only way that a holy God could continue to be a righteous judge and still save those wayward sheep from verse 6. And the only way that we could be saved is if, if the son, the perfect son, was willing to do what we see in verse 10. Offer himself as a guilt offering. He offered himself as the offering for our sin. As a result of the anguish that the Messiah will endure, verse 11, God the Father will see his sacrifice, the son's sacrifice, and wrath will be satisfied. Because the Lord God knows the righteous one. Not just, oh, I've heard of him. Oh, I heard he did something. The idea is that he acknowledges what it is that the son has done. He knows the son. He knows the sacrifice. He goes, this is the sacrifice. I recognize it. This is the payment for all of our sins. This is why we go to him in the name of the son. Your son died for my sins. His blood washed away all of my iniquity. So now I appeal to you. I come into your presence because I know that you're pleased in the son. 
This is what the Lord says from heaven, not once but twice. This is my son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And because of that relationship, Jesus will be able to justify many. Understand, it's not enough for us just to have a relationship with Jesus. If Jesus has no relationship with the Father, then our relationship with him does not save our souls. Because in every possible way, Jesus was perfect. His relationship with the Father is airtight. When we have a relationship with Jesus, we then have a relationship with the Father as well. And because of this, he is able to bear our sin to all who cry out to him. Because he poured himself out to death. He identified with us. He bore our sins. And now, verse 12, his portion will be great. We're his portion. We belong to him. Chapter 54. It is out of the sacrifice of Jesus that we have a promise of a new life. Because of what Israel and Judah will endure in the future, the Lord conveys this promise through the pain, the paradigm, the framework of someone who has never been able to bear any kids. So he's talking to a mom. Now, this is not an insignificant picture for Israel. For them, the idea of not being able to have a child was not just the despair of not being able to have a child. It was the social stigma that went along with it. Because they believed that the reason that you couldn't have kids is because you were a sinner, after all, under the Mosaic Covenant. If you do what I tell you to do, then you will not have a problem bearing children. But if you reject and you sin, then as a national unit, you're going to start to experience this problem. Well, they just made it very localized. Well, if you can't have kids, then it's your fault. Israel would be very sensitive to this image. Even in a historical sense, they would remember the difficulty that Sarah had and Rebekah had in having children. And even the wives of Jacob, who would eventually have eight of the 12 sons between them, had periods where they were unable to have kids. And it's within the context of that paradigm that God calls to the barren one, to the woman who has not had children. This is a mother who's never had a child and says, verse 1, shout for joy. Enlarge the place of your tent. Move the tent stakes out, or we, we might say, Mom, you're going to need a bigger house. Making your tent bigger was a huge act of faith. Because remember, these are people that never had kids before. And it almost seems cruel to say to this mother, Mama, you're going to need a bigger house because of all your kids. And she's going to look at you and go, what kids? So God tells them in verse 4, do not fear. You will not be put to shame. Don't feel humiliated. You will not be disgraced. This is an important verse we need to take courage from. Because what this is, is the encouragement to someone like the layman from Acts chapter 3. Or the man with the withered hand from Luke chapter 6. Remember that moment where Jesus has this man with a withered hand. That means it's all shrunk up. And he has him come and stand in front of him, in front of everybody at the synagogue. And after he condemns the hardness of the hearts of the people in the room, what does he tell this man with the withered hand? He says, stretch out your hand. It almost seems cruel. Jesus, you know I can't do that. Why would you mock me in front of everyone? But with God's calling comes God's equipping. And if he will just take that step of faith, if he will trust in the person who gave him the command, then God will give him the ability to do what he could not do on his own. We must remember who it is that we serve. It's another beautiful application of Isaiah 45 2. Isaiah 45 2. Our God goes before us. He makes the rough places smooth. Before this trip through Isaiah, I thought I had all the verses that I just loved in this book. But I have lived out 45 2. I have watched the Lord go before me. Things that I thought were impossible, He made the rough places smooth. God equips the called. And if He calls you to do something, he will see you to that which you are called. Not according to your definitions. But he charges us and makes his promise in verse 4 to all have a new life in him. Do not be afraid of answering my call. If you step out in faith, you will not be put to shame. God seals this promise to Israel and to us by binding us to himself in a marriage relationship in verse 5. 
Now, again, remember who he's talking to inside this paradigm, inside of this framework. This is a woman who cannot have kids. And he's going, and he's going to say, I'm going to marry you. I will be your husband. Now, this wasn't done at the time. You knew somebody couldn't have children. You didn't go and marry them. You needed kids. You needed to continue this house. God says, I bind myself to you. And Jesus applies the same relationship to himself, Revelation 19.7. Revelation 19.7, the marriage and the wedding supper of the Lamb. Then on top of that, he reminds us, and you're not getting just some average husband. I am the maker of all creation. I am your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the God of all the earth. So if anyone can keep us from shame and renew our life, it's him. Verse 7 and 8, God tells Israel, I'm not ignorant of your pain. He points out that for a moment, fellowship has been broken. It's been broken because of my anger at your sin. It's something that God frequently reminds me of, right? Uh, the gifts and callings, uh, callings of God are irrevocable, Romans 11:29. That means whatever he's called you to, he will never take that calling away. It doesn't mean you can't disqualify yourself from serving. It doesn't mean that you get to do whatever it is that you want. Gifts and callings stay. It's why some people in some ministry offices seem to continue to have effect. And you wonder why. The gifts and callings stay, but the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit upon us can be removed. Fellowship can be broken by our sin. The Lord can choose to take his hand away. Think about one of the saddest moments in the Bible with Samson, Judges chapter 16, when he has so utterly compromised his life. Even the last thing, the cutting of his hair, he's just kind of thrown away that information as well. Nothing matters to him anymore. He's so full of himself. And with his hair cut, he's told, Samson, get up. The Philistines are upon you. And we're told that he gets up like he's going to fight. He's going to fight them off like he did any other time. But here's the sad part. But he did not know that the Lord was no longer with him. Fellowship can be broken. The Lord can depart from us. This is why David weeps the way that he does in Psalm 51. Why he begs the Lord in verse 11 of that psalm, please don't cast me away from you. And please don't take your spirit away from me. The responsibility and the calling upon us remains. But the anointing to do it can be taken away by our sin. Yet even then, God has compassion on us. He longs for us to return. If only we will repent. And if we bear fruit worthy of repentance, that repentance, that's Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, if we receive Jesus, the suffering servant, as Lord, Isaiah 53, then with great loving kindness and compassion, the Lord will redeem us to himself. Verse 9 through 10, God compares this moment of restoration with Noah's flood. I mean, Noah's flood. What are we doing going back to that? I remember what happens there. In that moment, God decides, I must judge the wickedness of man on the earth. But he preserves those who trusted in him. Those who were perfect in their ways. The idea being they were complete in their generations. They continued to follow the Lord. And as they come out of that flood, after he opens the door of the ark, he makes a new covenant with them. This covenant of Noah, a covenant of love and peace that will never be taken away. God ties that covenant to Noah to this one in chapter 4 that will eventually be called the new covenant, Jeremiah 31 and Luke 22. Jeremiah 31 and Luke 22. It is this unbreakable covenant that we have with the Father through the Messiah. Through it, the loving kindness and the peace of God will never be taken from us. Now, verse 11 through 17, God comforts a bruised and beat up Israel that appears to be going into the millennial reign of Christ. That's why it's so important to understand that the reference to Noah comes before it. Because what happens in that moment with Noah? God sends judgment upon the entire earth. What happens in the great tribulation? God sends judgment upon the entire earth, but he preserves this remnant that he will save to himself. 
Verse 11 through 12, God describes how he's going to bless Israel coming into the millennial reign, the millennial kingdom. Verse 11 and 12 is the financial blessings. Verse 13 is the family blessings. 14 through 17 is their security blessings. And he goes, and if any enemy is still dumb enough to attack you, they will be defeated. Why? Because of verse 17, look at it, please. No weapon formed against you will prosper. It doesn't mean that there won't be weapons. And it doesn't mean there won't be attacks. But they will not prosper against you. Why? Because of verse 10. Because Israel, my beloved, will have a covenant of peace with God. Chapter 55. Verse 1 and 2, God gives us an invitation that will be beautifully repeated in Revelation 22, 17. In Revelation 22, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, so that's us, will have this invitation to everyone. Come, let the one who hears come, and the one who is thirsty come. Let one who wishes take the water of life without cost. That's the qualifier. Come and receive from God what you cannot possibly buy. And that's how this chapter begins, with God inviting the one who has nothing to offer to buy from him what they cannot afford. Then he asks them, why do you spend what you do have on what does not satisfy? It doesn't make any sense, but boy, look around, especially in our country. We waste our resources on things that, don't, that, that we don't own that always end up owning us. Do we count the true cost of what it is to purchase this thing or purchase that? How many of us would look at our, our history on Amazon and go, did I buy that? I don't even remember that thing. Where is that thing? Or go into your closet and you find a box of something that you just had to have back then, but you didn't even remember that it was there. Why do we spend our resources on that which does not satisfy? When we could get from God for free what is good, that we cannot afford. Now, verses 3 through 4, God calls David up to the witness stand. All of a sudden, he's bringing up witnesses to testify of the faithfulness of God. And we're like, what? this stuff is all coming out of nowhere. Here we had Noah, now we have David, but this is for a purpose. Because of what David represents for Israel. And God is going to tell Israel, here, listen to David, listen about my faithfulness, but I want you to go ahead and get this in your mind because the next thing I'm about to tell you is I'm going to call the, Gentile, the Gentiles to repentance as well. And when they hear that, they are going to be upset. And so the first thing he does, he goes, let's hear from David so you remember who it is who has saved you as well. God tells him, I'm going to call these people. I'm going to call all the world. I'm going to tell all the world, seek the Lord while he may be found, verse 6. And we often lose sight as, as Gentiles, even those of us that have Jewish roots. But we live in this Western world, and we, we forget how challenging the idea will be to the Jews, the idea that the, the wicked Gentiles who had oppressed us could ever be forgiven by God. Such a thought was anathema to them. It was a cursed idea. It was unthinkable to them. And we will see it throughout the book of Acts. Them struggling with this idea, how at times they'll be listening to a prophet or listening to an apostle, and everything will be going great. They're all like, we're with you, Paul, keep talking. And then he goes, and then I was sent to the Gentiles, and right there they want to stone him and tear him to pieces. They will struggle with this so much, because they will suffer so much at the hands of the Gentiles. But God shows his heart in verse 6 and 7, that his desire is to call all of us, when he says, let the wicked forsake their way, he's not just saying, let the wicked Jews forsake their way. Let everyone who's wicked repent and turn back. For the mercy of God is abundant, and the Lord is more than able to save. Because he knows that Israel will struggle with this, he tells them in advance of the coming of the Messiah. And, and he tells them, or I'm sorry, he tells them in advance of the coming of the Messiah this. My thoughts are not your thoughts. God, we don't get it. How can you save them? Because my ways are not your ways. For as the high, heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we use those verses all the time to show the superiority of the plans of God to the plans of men. Magnificent, beautiful, and true. But it's worth remembering that the initial application of this particular verse 
is here in Isaiah 55 in defense of the Lord God Almighty choosing you and choosing me. It's the old joke. When you get to heaven, there's going to be three surprises. You'll be surprised at who's there. You'll be surprised at who's not. And you'll be surprised that you've made it. This is the reality. Nobody else would have chose us. But God chose us. Verse 10 through 11, God shows that his salvation will come through his word, right? Which for us is a reference both to the one who is called the word, John chapter 1, and the reference to the words on the page. It is through his word that we are told about the word and that many will be saved. Indeed, indeed, declaring the word of God will not return as empty words. We will see the effect, or whether we see the effect or not, the word of God will accomplish the will of God. But here's the thing I want you to understand. When we see word, we kind of take it in our English mind. Well, the same word is here and the word is there, so they must be the same thing, two different words. The word in Hebrew that we have here is the idea of declaring the fullness of one's mind. The idea of logos in the New Testament is the reason, the rationale that's behind everything that exists. On the supernatural level, they both discuss the same ideas. It is not limited to the words on the page. Because you can manipulate this word, and throughout history many have. But the heart of God that is behind these words, when we declare that true, when we declare what is consistent with the name and the character of Christ, that will always accomplish all that God desires. Verse 12 through 13, God reminds Israel that the Gentiles are not coming to take Israel's place. Regardless of what some teach, the church does not replace Israel. Chapter 56. Verse 1 and 2, we have a people, we have a call to the people to preserve justice and to do righteousness, for the salvation of the Lord is about to come. We'll hear the same idea later on with John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, the first words from God to the people after 400 years of silence. And what were those words? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. On both sides of this divide of silence, we have this call. Repent, do righteousness, return back to God, for salvation is near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's beautiful, the symmetry that we have between these two moments. Because that moment in Matthew chapter 3 itself is a reference to Isaiah 40 chapter 3. So from Isaiah, we go to Matthew, which takes us back to Isaiah. We see the loop, how it's all connected. This symmetry is not a coincidence. Because what we see in verses 3 through 6 is the Lord reassuring the Gentiles that there is a place for you in the future house of God. Again, this is something the Israelites are going to struggle with. Jews will struggle with this idea of them having a place. And there will be a concern even early on in the book of Acts where the Jewish widows will receive special treatment, but the Greek widows will not. And what God is saying, there is a place for all of you. And not just you who are of different ethnic backgrounds. But even people like eunuchs who previously had been excluded from public assembly of worship, Deuteronomy 23.1. Deuteronomy 23.1. Now, in Deuteronomy 23.1, God says that those who are are, uh, mutilated in their genitals, so they have been castrated, their sexual organs have been cut off in order for them to serve in certain roles. The vast majority of these times, It was not because of something that you did, or that you chose. It was done to you. They were not allowed to gather in public assemblies of worship. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't worship. They still could. They could still draw in close to God. But when there were times for the assembly to come together, they could not be with the rest of the group. And God was declaring a very firm and a somewhat harsh message, but it needs to be heard, that the only way you can draw close to God is to be perfect and complete in all of your ways. The lesson was not, you guys aren't told, so you can't come close. The idea is, all of you are broken. You must all draw into me through the one who is perfect and complete in all of his ways. And now through Jesus, there is a place for all of them to walk directly to God, to gather with the assembly. And through Jesus, God will give them a legacy that's even better than children. So what he tells them, I'm going to give you a name, a lasting character, a quality of life and a legacy that you can't get through kids. 
through Jesus, the servants of the Lord will not be determined by your lineage, where, what group you came from, nor by your children. But whether or not you held fast, you held dear the covenant of God, verse 6. Verse 7 through 8, God confirms this heart to gather in all the excluded, everyone who's been left out, verses 7 and 8. And he declares words that will be echoed by Jesus in Matthew 21, 13. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And here in Isaiah, God adds this. For all nations or for all the people. This idea of being able to gather close to the Lord. To cry out to his name is not restricted to just Israel. It's not an Israel-only club. But it is for all who would actively seek the Lord. Verse 9 through 12, we have this contrast to those uh, contrast to those that the Lord will bring in. God talks about the leaders of Israel who will not be drawn in because they should have known better. And rather than being sober and seeking after the Lord, what are they doing in verse 12? They're getting drunk. Because in their head, everything's always the same. Tomorrow will be like today. Every day will be like the one before it. So why bother repenting? When is the Lord going to come back? You keep saying he's going to do these things, but every day is the same. So we can keep doing whatever we want. Things will always be like this. While God will gather his people from all over the world, these leaders will be judged. Their dead bodies will feed the beasts of the field. And this invitation that we have here will be repeated vividly. Ezekiel 39.17. Ezekiel 39.17. When God invites the beasts of the field to feast on the bodies of the wicked. In Revelation 19, 17 through 18, Revelation 19, 17 through 18, when God invites the birds of the air to swoop down to feast on the bodies of the wicked as well. Chapter 57. In verses 1 and 2, the Lord continues addressing the wicked. Remember, these are uh, chapter, chapter divisions are added later, so this is a continual thought. He's still talking to them. He points out that the righteous perish, but you guys don't appear to care. You almost have this impression like, oh, we're winning. We must be doing the best because we keep being wicked and we keep surviving. They seem to be righteous, but they're dying away. And God goes, you don't get it. Verse 2 tells us the righteous are actually being ushered into peace. I'm removing them from what's about to happen. But conversely, you, verses 3 through 13, you are going to a different end. God calls out the wicked idol worshipers in verse 3. He asks them in verse 4, who do you think you're kidding? You think I don't know who you are? Verses 5 through 9, God lists the various idolatrous acts they have been performing. And verse 10 tells us that even when you got tired with this wickedness, on those days you woke up and you're like, man, I think I'm kind of wickeded out. Instead of repenting, you just doubled down on it. You purposed in your mind, to follow an evil path. Verse 11, God confronts him and says, you didn't fear me at all during this time. None of you gave me a second thought, but I saw what you were doing. So now when you receive what you deserve, cry out to your false gods to deliver you. Don't even bother crying out to me. Judges 10, 14. Judges 10, 14. And we'll see this again in the book of Jeremiah as well. But, the end of verse 13, he who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. He even gives these evil leaders a chance to repent and to turn to him. Our God does not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Instead, he commands his servants to prepare a way to remove the obstacles from the path. So his people that are contrite, the idea of being contrite is being beat down. And those who are lowly and humble can return. He just called for them to repent. And now he makes a way for them to come back. It's another beautiful application of Isaiah 45 too. God goes before us. He makes the rough places smooth. His dynamic is not this. I'm going to show you that you're sinners and you're lost without me and you're all dying and going to hell. And we're like, Lord, how, what shall we do to be saved? He doesn't go, okay, all you have to do is swim the largest ocean and climb the highest mountain. And if you do enough stuff, then you can be saved. Instead, what he does is he removes the obstacles out of our path. 
He makes the rough places smooth so it's as easy as possible to return. And while we're on that path returning to him, we learn 15, verse 15, that even as we're on that path, he's already with us. We don't have to wait till we get to his house for him to be with us. Even as we're in the way, he is reviving our hearts and our spirit so that even then we can be with him. Verse 16, God reminds us that there's consequences for our sin. But it's not his desire to stay angry at us forever. Even when we're far away, it's still the desire of God to heal us, to lead us and restore us, verse 18. He will give us the praise that we sing. The idea is, I'm going to give you a reason to praise me. And he will give us peace, but not just any peace. Perfect peace. Shalom, shalom, verse 19. But the wicked are like a turbulent sea. Verse 21, the wicked will have no peace. Chapter 58. Verse 1, God starts talking to his prophet. Most likely he's talking directly to Isaiah, not just a general call to prophet. But he goes, I want you to confront my people with their sin. In verse 2 through 3, the people start pushing back and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We've been doing good stuff too. We've been doing lots of religious deeds. We've been fasting and, and praying. We always show up on Christmas and Easter. But they claim, see, the problem is that God doesn't take notice of our work. You haven't seen all the good stuff I've been doing. Verse 4, God reveals, no, no, I have noticed. But I didn't respond to your deeds because I know you didn't do any of these things to be heard by me. You are attempting to manipulate God into moving on your behalf for your wicked gain. Verse 5 through 7, God asks Israel a similar question that he asks Israel in Zechariah 7, 4 through 6. Zechariah 7, 4 through 6. In Zechariah chapter 7, several Jews are back in the area. They're rebuilding the temple. And in chapter 7, they, they go to Zechariah and go, uh, could you ask the Lord? When we were in captivity, we prayed a couple months of the year, but now that we're back in Jerusalem, do we need to keep fasting like this, even though God never asked us to? And God asked him, them this question. He goes, listen, when you would do all this fasting, did you really do it for me? Or did you do it to make yourselves feel better? Make yourselves feel like you were doing something to earn my love again? Instead of this theatrical outburst, why don't you just do what I asked you to do? Loosen the bonds of wickedness. Free the oppressed, break every yoke. Share what you have with the hungry. Give the homeless a place to belong. And when you see someone in need, help them. Don't hide from your own flesh. Don't pretend like you don't see them. It's what God told him in Deuteronomy 22. When you see your neighbor is vulnerable, help them out. Don't pretend like helping them is someone else's job. This exhortation is very similar to what God tells his people in Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Verse 8 through 11, if we do what we're called to do, then our light will break out like the dawn. Now, it's a beautiful image, but it's a little bit lost on us. I mean, what does that even mean? Now, thankfully, we live in a world after the cross, after 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7. So we have a reference for this idea of this light breaking out. But in the Old Testament, the idea is of the glory of Israel being made visible to other nations. But the reason is not because Israel's so great. The idea is because they are dwelling with the Lord. The Lord is dwelling with them, so the glory of the Lord is shining out from them which is the context of 1 John 1, 7. Because if we are dwelling in the light as he is in the light, if we are in that close fellowship with him, then the light of the world will shine from our lives. It's a picture of the abundance of the relationship that we have with Christ. And if we keep our fellowship clean by obeying the heart of God, then when we call out, God will answer. We will cry for help, and the, and the Lord will say, here I am, verse 9. Make sure that verse is underlined in your Bible, because you're going to need it. You're going to need to know that he's there. The Lord will be our constant guide, verse 11, but what's more, verse 12, God will use us 
to rebuild what is lost. This is one of the sweetest verses that should encourage all of us to be the hands and feet of Christ. To understand that when we gather with the body of Christ, we do not come to be served. We come to serve. And he goes, I will use you mightily to rebuild the ancient ruins. And look at this wonderful uh, uh, description that we will be called by. You will be called the repairer of the breach. You will be called the one who goes and rebuilds what was lost. Such beautiful symmetry we'll have in the New Testament Sermon on the Mount when Jesus tells us, blessed are those who are the peacemakers, for you should be called the sons and daughters of God. In verse 13, God appears to be top, uh, switching topics. Of course, he never does. But what he does here, uh, he makes the topic uh, of obedience very personal to us. He tells us that on the day that he tells us to be with him, we should put obedience to him above what we want and we prefer. Now, he does it through the context of the Sabbath. He says, even on this day, you still manage to make it about you. On this day of worship, you make it about you. Is it convenient to you? Is it close enough to you? He's not talking to the wicked here. Verse 13 and 14 are not two pagan worshipers. God is talking to those who claim to be the people of God. And he tells them, on this day when you are to honor me, to re uh, reflect that you're resting in me, do you still make it about you? Do you do what pleases you that day? What conforms neatly into your schedule and your preferences? Or do you deny yourself and delight in me? And to make sure we understand the force of this statement, this isn't a suggestion to us. He give us, gives us the end of verse 14, and please look at it. Because after he's talking to us, to the people of God, and he says, you need to deny yourself and take delight in me, he says this, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It is a bold, no-nonsense phrase. Chapter 59. In verse 1, God sets the stage. Your situation is not because the Lord was too weak to save you, but because of verse 2, your sin. Your sin separated you from God. It was like a dark cloud that suddenly sweeps across the sky and blocks the sun from your sight. Your sins have hidden his face from you. It's not that he didn't want to shine upon you, but your sin got in the way. Verses 3 through 8 list the charges against Israel. The sins are vivid and vicious. Verse 9 through 15, Isaiah speaks on behalf of his people. And what does he do? It's all their fault. No, he goes, we're sinful. Justice is far from us. He confesses on the part of the nation. He says, we grope around like blind men in the dark. Verse 12, our sins are multiplied before you, Lord. Verse 13, we turn from you. Therefore, verse 14, justice has turned from us. In verse 15, the person who turns away from God makes them a juicy target for the wicked. In the second half of verse 15, we see Isaiah tells us that the Lord was looking around, but there was no justice. And that was displeasing in his sight. It displeased the Lord that there was nobody who could send, he could send to intercede on his behalf. We had this earlier in the book of Isaiah as well, where he has this wonderful message. He has this glorious joy to send. And he goes, I was looking for a messenger, but there was nobody I could find. So what did I do? I sent my son. I sent the Messiah. The same dynamic happens here. There was nobody that the Lord could send on his behalf. So what? The Lord brought salvation himself, verse 17. In verse 17, we see God putting on the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. He's preparing for war. And he repays the enemies of Israel for their deeds. But to Israel, he shows up in his armor. Right? He, he never changes out of it. He goes all the way to Zion, all the way to his people. But he comes to them as redeemer. He's the redeemer, the one who purchases back all those who have repented from their sins. In verse 21, he doesn't make a covenant with them. He confirms a covenant with them. Chapter 16. With this people who enjoy the new covenant with God, God declares that the light of his glory will rescue them from the darkness, verse 2. This won't just be for their benefit, 
But verse 3 and 4, it will draw all the nations and their scattered people to return to Jerusalem. And when Israel sees this, they will rejoice. And the wealth of nations will flow into them as God restores their standing. And why are they coming? Because of verse 9. Because the Holy One of Israel has glorified them. Now what we have here is this picture of the millennial kingdom. It comes out of the previous chapter. When does God put on this armor and come down and judge the nations who are the enemies of Israel? The battle of Armageddon, end of the great tribulation. And he comes all the way to Zion, all the way to Jerusalem. And he comes and he gathers those that he saved. What we see in verse 10 through 14 is that these four nations who once oppressed Israel will be the ones to build them back up. Some of those people are going to make it through the great tribulation. Verse 15 tells us, shows us how God takes them from their past of being hated. Israel was hated by these nations. But now they're going to a future where they will be the Lord's everlasting pride. Verse 17 shows us that God is going to flip the military situation of Israel. So instead of nations bringing weapons of bronze and weapons of iron, they will bring silver and gold instead. They're coming with tribute. But then we have the statement, and then instead of wood, you'll have this metal, and instead of stone, you'll have that metal. And we're like, wait a minute, I thought they weren't bringing that. They're not. The images of wood and stone are the images that you would have inside the city to make your wall strong. You would go and figure out, how do I make this wall stronger? I go tear down other buildings, take those rocks, and pile them off the, on the wall so it's harder for them to break through. But you won't need that anymore because instead of going on the defense, you're going on the offense. You will be the ones who will need weapons, not them. But you won't need them anyway, because God will give you peace, verse 17 and 18. Now, that is pictures of the millennial kingdom. In verse 19 and 20, we have beautiful pictures of the new earth. And we know this because we're told that you will need no sun. There will no longer be a sun, for the Lord himself will be our light. Now, what this tells us is that I, Isaiah is seeing both the millennial kingdom of Jesus and the new earth, Revelation 22.5, Revelation 22.5, he's seeing them as one large vision. He doesn't have them broken out for himself, or he's choosing not to define them as separately. This isn't an error, it's not a contradiction in the text. But what God is conveying to Israel and to us, that it is his plan to bless them even through the darkest of times. That this is my final goal, this is what we are working towards and the Jews may wonder, when is this going to happen? In verse 22, he tells us, I will make it happen when it is time. 